Nostalgia seems to be such an innocent pleasure. We're not taking anything away from anyone else. We're not planning to stake claims on anything in the future. We're just rifling through our own memories. But it is one of the causes for samsara. We think of the places we've been. We like to go back. And if that desire hits you at the moment of death, it's going to have an impact on where you go. And even now, in the present moment, it blinds you to what you're doing right now. You're off in another world someplace. And so you have to see that it has its drawbacks. Because first off, you can never go back to the way things were. Even if you go back to the same place, and physically nothing much has changed. You've changed as a person. The other people around there have changed. You end up going back. And you find out that it's not the place you thought it was. Part of this, of course, has to do with the fact that your nostalgic memory is like every memory of sensual pleasure. It's very selective. When you're back at that spot in that time, there were uncertainties, there were fears, disappointments. But the feeling of what it was like to actually live in that space at that time gets scrubbed so that you have only the nice details. So you have to realize your mind is lying to you, and you don't want your life to be directed by lies. So as dealing with any unskillful mind state or any unskillful habit, the Buddha offers several ways of analyzing things. First off, he says you have to see it as something separate. The memory is one thing, you're something else. Don't go into it. Step out of it and see this is something the mind is creating right now. And you've seen it as something separate, then there are two modes of analysis that the Buddha would have you pursue. One is to take it apart into its individual components. The memory is composed of a feeling, a perception, thought fabrications. Just tease them out. What are the perceptions? What are the ways you're talking to yourself about it? See those as separate components. And the more you see them as separate components, the more you realize that they're pretty ephemeral. Hints, whispers, shadows of things, nothing really substantial. And yet you want this to guide your life, guide your future. The other type of analysis is to see it as part of a causal process, what gives rise to this nostalgic memory. Sometimes, of course, it just pops up on its own, but then you go for it. This is where you have to look for the, the allure. Why do you go for it? What are you missing right now? And what are the stages by which the mind goes into that? A thought pops up, and it doesn't come up fully formed. It's going to be, again, hints, whispers. And part of the mind says, hey, this could be a memory of my old time back then. Let's go for it. And it comes with a set of, of a script, ready-made. Where did that come from? How many times you've been over certain memories and added something new each time? Why? What is it that the mind wants to get out of this memory? And then where does it go? So you look at the, the memory as part of a causal process. It comes, and then it goes. And it comes back again some other time, and goes again. When it goes, why does it go? Partly because of those component factors it's made out of. These things have to be sustained. There has to be an act of attention and intention 
to keep them going. And the intention has to be fed by the allure. But they have to realize that this is suffering. You're clinging to these different aggregates. And what are you getting out of them? You're placing ruts in the mind, as the Buddha said. Actually, his word would be that it bends the mind. We would say they're ruts. You get into the rut and it's hard to get out. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha said that lack of nostalgia is one of the ways of putting an end to suffering. Because you see that your memories are totally unreliable. They may have a little bit of truth to them, but each time you take them out of the mind and look at them and put them back, something changes. It's like a person going through a library, picking out a book, and then doing what librarians hate, which is put the book back in a different place. Keep on doing that and the whole library gets rearranged. Nobody can find anything. And you have to remember that the place, the time for which you feel the nostalgia, it's long gone. It's the nature of all time. You went back there. If you were to go back, you'd find it would pass, would pass, pass. Think of a John Fuhring's comment that the sensual pleasures for which we really have strong desires are the ones that we've had in the past, but we lost them. Now we want them back again. And suppose we do get them back again. We're going to lose them again. Where are you going to find any fulfillment? Where does anything come to any kind of conclusion? Where can you really claim, lay claim to something and say, I've got it? It's like trying to put something in a net, but the net has a big hole in the bottom. You catch it, and it's like catching a butterfly. You catch it, and it just flies out of the net. In the meantime, you've been chasing the butterfly deeper and deeper into unknown territory. And if you create this as a habit, this is where the mind is going to go as life comes to an end. Because at that point, you're not going to want to be thinking about the future very much. It doesn't present much in terms of hope. So the mind will cast back to the past. Because the mind is, is really good at looking for pleasures wherever it can find them. You see people in pretty miserable situations, and yet they're always looking for pleasure of some kind. What are the possibilities there? And they'll grasp at anything. Though well, the mind, as it approaches death, is going to grasp at anything, unless it's trained. So we're training it now. So when those memories come up, we can take them apart into their component parts. We can see them as part of a causal process and gain a sense of some wager around them. So that the next time they come, you're not quite so likely to want to go for them. This is good work to be doing now, so you don't have to do all the work then. You want to master this as a skill, how to step out of mind states, how to take them apart. So you can end this process of wandering into these mind states, creating worlds, and then wandering into the worlds, because it goes on and on and on. As the Buddha saw in the night of his awakening, we try to cast back in the past how long this has been going on. He says, you can't find the beginning point. More than that, he said, it's inconceivable. What would a beginning point be? As for how much longer it's going to go, that's going to depend on whether you train the mind. Think of all the lives you've been through. If you can't remember a specific lifetime, just think about it, just aeons and aeons of being different beings. And it's all gone, gone, gone. And what does the future hold if you don't get out? It's just more of the same. Things that come and then go, go, go. So 
So when you think about this, it's pretty chastening. It should be enough to get the mind to be more willing to stay here in the present moment and say, I've got to figure out the motor behind all this, what what's keeps generating these thoughts, what keeps wanting to go for them, what can be done to turn the motor off. Because when you see that all that it creates will fall apart, you begin to wonder, why should I just keep on creating? And that's when you've really got the attitude that's ready for the practice. You've been chastened, have a sense of dismay. But don't get depressed. You realize, okay, there is a way out. This is why the Buddha has you delight in the Dharma, delight in developing skillful qualities and taking unskillful qualities apart. To find that as a fascinating project. Rather than being fascinated by your nostalgic memories, be fascinated by what the mind is doing and how it deceives itself. If you can develop a passion and delight for that, that leads you in the right direction. <laughs>